For thousands of years, Malta has been a strategic hotspot for the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Moors, medieval knights, and modern-day navies. This year, the port of Valletta is the cultural capital of Europe. And as we watch it wake up here on the Piazza della Regina, get ready for a rapid tour of the city's total makeover. The palaces, the markets, the gardens, the theaters, the nightlife, and boutique hotels that have made Valletta a cultural hotspot. Come with us on the maiden voyage of our new program, Go Europe. The renovation and rebirth of the city is everywhere you look. Stunning Baroque architecture from the 16th century and beyond. Many of the ornate buildings here in Valletta used to belong to the Knights of St. John. This one is called the Auberge de Castille, and it now houses the office of Malta's Prime Minister. Nearby is the Palazzo Ferreria, named after the Knights' foundry that it replaced in the 19th century. There's the facade of St. John's Co-Cathedral, Valletta's Baroque centerpiece, also restored inside to its original splendor. The cathedral has two works by Caravaggio, who painted the beheading of St. John the Baptist during his stay in Malta. The marble floor is a series of tombs for hundreds of knights and officers of the order. Restoration is a continuous effort, as you can see here. And there's new construction using the same traditional stone. This main city gate is part of a project by Italian architect Renzo Piano, which also included the National Parliament, built on what used to be a parking lot. The open gate design is a radical departure from the previous ones through the city's history. Architect Chris Brifa combines the outlines of those gates into a work called Prospettiva. What we try to do here is to design an icon taking cues for, from all the previous gates in the city and deconstruct it in a way to create this kind of empty space, which is what Renzo Piano did. And somehow, at, at, when you stand in one point in time, in one place, you see them all come together. Near Prospettiva, Brifa shows us the historical progression all mapped out. So these are the previous gates of Valletta. Right. The first one is just a hole in the wall. The second one, Porto Reale, is when they started opening up the English gate, eventually the, the Italian Maltese gate. So what we can see here is a microcosm of Valletta, which is changing with the times, which is allowing contemporary architecture, in, in a sense, into its most important part, the entrance, the gate. And the so, progression all the way down to Renzo Piano. Exactly. So this, in a way, is, is a perfect microcosm of the city, which is always changing, which is always reinventing itself. Valletta 2018 is a blessing on, on many levels. For me, as an architect, it's helpful because for the first time, People here recognize the importance of not only of conservation, but also of contemporary architecture and contemporary installations and art in a way that they could marry very well with the old if they are properly designed uh, with, with the right respect and the right balance to what has been already built before us. The reconstruction of Valletta has taken years and it's still happening. We speak with the Minister for Justice, Culture and Local Government. Valletta has changed drastically in the last years. Um, Valletta before was a silent city. It was almost a city where at night you would, you would be afraid to walk in the streets. Now Valletta is full of life, full of energy, full of dynamism. And I think that's pretty much um, related to uh, the title of Valletta Capital for Culture for Europe. EU funding was crucial in order to do most of the things we actually did in terms particularly of cultural infrastructure. So if we restored the major buildings here in Valletta, it was through EU money. On the upper Baraka Gardens, we talk about the renovation with a member of parliament. Deo Valletta has been preparing to be cultural capital of Europe for years. What's been the payoff? Yes, it has paid off. Only for this year, we already seen a 10% increase 
in tourism. All this investment, we literally revamped the city. We, we gave it the kiss of life. You wrote at the beginning of the year that this is only the beginning. Can you explain that? We don't intend to stop here. We have other areas which need renovation. But apart from that, even the cultural aspect, we, we intend to, to continue with what we began with Valletta 2018 Foundation. The 16th century building boom came after the Knights fought off the great siege of 1565 by the Ottomans. Here, Fort St. Elmo houses artifacts from that siege, as well as the one during World War II, when Germany and Italy bombarded the city, but failed to take it. This is one of the Italian bombs that landed here at 2,000 kilos. Valletta was bombed and strafed for two years, and convoys brought through provisions, but many of them hardly came through. Thousands of people were killed during that siege over two years during World War II. The museum features the George Cross that the British King awarded to the Maltese for resisting the siege, a cross that's now on the national flag. And attached to a torpedo is a red string construction by a Japanese artist that's part of a Malta-wide art exhibition called Constellation. As capital of culture, Valletta has transformed its restaurant and hotel sectors. The main covered market is called Isuk. And we get a tour from Maria McAuliffe, CEO of a family-owned company that runs the market with fresh food and an international food court. If Isuk sounds close to Arabic, it is, and so is some of the food here. Maltese is a descendant of Arabic dialects spoken in Spain and Sicily in the Middle Ages. Isuk was damaged during the siege of World War II and reopened in 2018 after extensive renovation. As you can see, it celebrates the colonial British architecture of the time with the wrought iron pinners, which most of them are from the original structure. Even the wooden ceiling here, 85% um, of it, we preserved the wood, and 85% of the wooden ceiling is the original. Restoring and rebuilding this market was a little more complicated than you thought. Tell us about it. The total investment here was 60 million. We were over budget because we, uh, we stuck to uh, conserving the place. We discovered old arches dating back from the times of the Knights of St. John. Um, the process took six months more than we were anticipating because while we were doing the constructions, we are also trying to build up part of the history of the, of the, of the market within the Maltese island context. One of the specialties here at the East Souk Market is called ftira. It actually means flat bread, but they put many things on top of it, layers and layers of cheese and vegetables. It's quite good. Valletta is a popular destination for cruise ships, but if you prefer to spend more time here, there are dozens of boutique hotels. One of them is 66 St. Paul's in a 17th century palazzo. Yes, it's like going back in time. And this is what is so niche about Valletta, which it's a very unique uh, place. There was a vision of doing boutique hotels in the city, doing restaurants within uh, um, old forts or in, in basements, which were used I don't know, for storing ammunition, for example, in the past. That brought a lot out of a lot of designers and architects to come up with something original, rather than building something new. A lot of boutique hotels like this one have their own restaurants. Let's go inside and see what Janine and her mother are preparing. Janine, hi, how are you? I nice see you, I can't wait, this is an adventure. Yes, we have a lot to do. Yeah, a lot of work. Well, yes, I hope to help out. It's torta tallampuki. We have the lemon zest, walnuts, crushed steamed potatoes with onions and garlic, the lampuki, the fish that we, that we cook in the oven, chopped capers, chopped olives, and, and spinach, fresh spinach.
I don't see any measuring cups. <laughs> I don't see any. I'm putting it like this for now, then we'll taste it. Janine's mother, Josette, says the recipe came from her mother, passed from generation to generation. And Josette is there for the moment of truth to make sure the final result is just right. And in this capital of culture, Amid the monuments and gardens, the palaces and churches is a cultural scene with various shapes and forms. Some are tucked away in the side streets. That's where we find Blitz, a contemporary art space bringing together both local and international talent. Alexandra Potch set up shop in what used to be her grandparents' home. She shows us this photo essay during a trip to northern Japan, one of the latest projects she has pursued at Blitz in an effort to bridge cultures. Blitz was um, set up in 2013 as, a, as an independent project space. Um, and it was set up um, to fill a gap, I felt, um, was there in between cultural institutions and, and artist studios. Um, so it was intended as a project space for experimental, innovative and emerging international art. We, we run an, an artist residency program here, which is part of the Valletta 2018 program. And we've had resident artists from as, as close as UK, Berlin, but we've also had uh, resident artists from Kuwait, from Casablanca, from Marrakesh, from Athens. And it's actually very interesting to see how they bring their multiculturalism and, and how that is uh, combined and influenced with the, with the very present multiculturalism that is, that is here. That multiculturalism resonates in this sound installation by a Korean artist in the Church of St. Mary Magdalene. We also check out some galleries across Valletta with various forms of contemporary art, this one with a series of 3D images. In another gallery, documents damaged during the siege of World War II became an art form for local photographer Alex Attar. During the war, they were blasted completely. Some of them were blasted and damaged and buried beneath, beneath rubble. And they've become completely useless. You can't open them, you can't read them anymore, and we don't know what they, what they hold, you know? So they were put away in boxes in what they call uh, the crying room because it's so sad to see such history going back from the time of the Knights, you know, destroyed as a consequence of war. They were looking like sculptures, you know? And sort of this idea came, came to me like, you know, why don't we try and give an alternative identity to these lost documents? You know, they're completely useless and, and create a kind of continuity to history which, which, is, which has been stopped, you know, because although they're destroyed, they're still historical documents and they still have a story to tell. With the gallery hopping in mind, we ask Pach what she thinks about the art market here. So I think there are these to be had. Um, uh, I think, I think at the moment there's, there's work to be done for the collectors to find the art and for the artists to tap into the collectors. I think that all the ingredients are there um, and I think this, the, the growth of the community in more than the change in it is something that's quite a, a recent but rapid change. So I think it is something that will take its time to reflect in, in a, in a well-developed art market. Here's a medieval knight's living quarters that's a new art space. The Musa Modern Art Museum is being housed in the Auberge d'Italie. We watched as workers were applying the finishing touches before the art went in. The wide range of architecture here in the various states of repair has lent itself to a backdrop for the movie business for decades. You might think some of this look like a movie scene, and you're right, a lot of films have been made here. This was a scene from World War Z, where the zombies were swarming towards Brad Pitt. Then there's the St. James Cavalier. 
It's now the location for a cultural center called Spatio Creativ, or Creative Space. This exhibit, called Nizga, or Web, features Maltese artists reflecting the country's history intertwined with its people. The woman in the suitcase exemplifies Malta's diaspora in places like Australia, Canada, and the U.S. On another floor is this temporary exhibit examining the issue of exile, linking it to Malta's own experience under British colonial rule, when nearby Manuel Island was off-limits for the Maltese. There are drawings and videos of migrant children of today. And you can walk through two rooms that give the sensation of being processed like a migrant or refugee yourself. Time to check out the nightlife, and facets there are many. Plenty of choice for those who want to dress up or let their hair down. There's high culture in music and stage, and you can do a photo safari in streets ornate with Baroque. There's classical tradition for the heavenly inclined, and for those into bar hopping, there are hallowed haunts for the club crowd. Our tour begins with a renovated Teatro Manuel, with musical and theatrical performances in Maltese as well as English. The revamp included the walls and ceiling, putting in new floors and seats and adding heating and air conditioning, allowing the theater to stay open 11 months out of the year. We speak with Manuel's artistic director, who saw performances here as a boy. This was built as a court theater, I remember, ostensibly in 1731 built, by the way, by a grandmaster who wanted to keep his young knights out of mischief. Um, and, of course, you can imagine what it was like in, in, in the early 18th century with all these young bloods roaming around Valletta, you know, instead of, and they had to give them something to do. So um, they, <laughs> he invented, he had this theatre built literally to keep them out of mischief, literally amateur theatricals. Today, the Manuel offers a highly sophisticated lineup, reaching out to locals and visitors alike. We have opera, we have orchestral concerts, we have um, piano recitals, chamber music. While a set is being painted, you know, the curtains can close, and we have a, in front of the curtain, we have, say, a, a, a jazz concert. So there's a lot, there's, a, there's an eclectic mix. Tabona says that eclectic mix includes this English language version of Amadeus, played here to a sellout crowd. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Eclectic, too, when Bach is played with four saxophones at Valletta's annual Baroque Fest in January, with concerts in palaces, theaters, museums, and churches across the city. The festival doesn't only take place in this theater, which is a lovely 1731 theater, Baroque theater par excellence, but also it is, it takes place in treasures, architectural and artistic treasures, like St. John's Coke Cathedral. On to ground zero of Valletta's nightlife, a place where many a sailor from around the world roamed. Talk about a total makeover, the clientele is very different now. We want to give you a taste of the nightlife starting with Straight Street, which used to be the most infamous street here in Valletta. It's also called the Strada Stretta, once full of rough and tumble bars and brothels, now with cafes and restaurants. We meet Andre Imbrol, who has driven the makeover of a whole block, historically known as the Gut now with upscale bars and eateries, including local and Asian fare. Once full of jazz clubs, there's now a wide range of music from rock to folk to jazz to hip hop. My parents wouldn't allow me to come here when we were kids. This place was uh, originally the red light district of Malta. Um, so, you know, it's, it's quite famous nowadays, but uh, it's as, as famous as it is uh, infamous as well. We're seeing a huge comeback for Straight Street and Valletta in general as a, as a nightlife district for a, for a higher-end uh, customer. Us, 
Andre even lets me take my turn at playing crooner with the band on a platform he added for performances. So how to take it all in? The nightlife in Valletta, as it is developing now, uh, I think one of the best experiences would be bar hopping. So uh, for a nightlife district to develop, uh, you cannot have just one place or one, you know, one corner, one hub. You're seeing you know, lots of uh, social media groups gathering together for, for bar hopping experiences. And they move from the gut to, you know, to the upper part of Straight Street, to St. Paul Street, to St. Ursula, to Santa Lucia, and various other uh, areas which are developing into, into nightlife spots. It's the day after and we head to St. George's Square where kids and grown-ups are gathering for the Valletta 2018 parade. The theme is a cross-cultural one based on a theatrical performance titled Orfeo and Majnun. It combines two love stories similar to Romeo and Juliet. Orfeo and Majnun sing to wild beasts about their love for Eurydice and Leila. To build up our strength for the parade, it's time to try another Maltese must, a popular kind of flaky, savory pastry filled with ricotta or peas for people on the go. There's something you really got to try here in Valletta. It's called pastizzi. And in fact, your grandfather yes. did the recipe, right? He did the first recipe that he took to Toronto, Canada. We were the first people in Toronto to take this And, and you're famous here, too, I guess. Yes, we are. We are. Well, let's try it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give it a try. This is with, uh, with the peas in it. With the peas, yeah, the pizzelli. Mm. No wonder the Maltese expression selling like pastizzi or selling like hotcakes. We catch up with the parade heading to the main city gate, featuring the children, performers, and more than a dozen marching bands from all over Malta. It's the entire country gathered here to celebrate Valletta as capital of culture. And for the head of the Valletta 2018 Foundation, it's been like a fairy tale. We had the Sleeping Beauty, but this is the awakening of the Sleeping Beauty. I mean, Valletta is a, is a beauty, has been a beauty for over 450 years. But somehow it was left to much neglect over the last or recent years. So, with the opportunity and the experience of holding our first ever European Cup of Culture as a nation, not only as Valletta, was a huge opportunity not to be missed for us to regenerate this beautiful, unique city. He says the aim in doing so was not simply restoring the heritage. It is a challenge. Uh, it was very easy for us to regenerate Valletta into a huge, big open air museum. We did not want that. So we wanted to give much more public spaces to the people. We wanted to give people where to eat, where to go after watching uh, the cinema, after watching a very good opera, at the theatre, other events. So I think we have managed to, to find a very, very proper balance. At the end of the parade, there's a performance outside City Gate depicting the dramatic and turbulent history of Malta and its capital city, from the sieges and colonial rule to independence and finally EU membership all making up what Valletta is today. That's all for now on Go Europe. From all of us here on the Euronews team, we say Saha, goodbye, and thanks for watching.